good? <laughs> it's a little movement, but yes. All right. Welcome to tonight, uh, week four or five, nutrition talk. We're going to talk a little bit about protein. Um, actually, not just protein, but I want to talk about sort of the myth of too much protein. And I've, I've given you all a couple of handouts here. First, I want to start with the Harvard Health Publishing Handout. Okay? So it's when it, it says when it comes to protein, how much is too much. So this is a common thought that we can take in too much, and you know, we can do that type of thing to our bodies. Thank you. <laughs> this is a common thought for that. So there's a couple of things I want to address about this. And before, before I get into the first highlight, there's a, a personal story I have about this that kind of brings it home. I used to, I used to buy some protein from GNC. It was at the time the cleanest protein I could find. I was at that point taking in 200 calories per day just of that protein supplement. Huh. That's not, that doesn't sound right. Do it. That doesn't sound you. 200 calories? Two, 200 grams, sorry. Oh, 200 grams. Yeah, oh, sorry, okay. sorry. You're so right, you're right. Calories. I thought you're right. 200 calories, I thought that sounds like yeah, a scoop. 200 a scoop. grams okay, just 200 from grams. the protein supplement. Just from the supplement. It doesn't count oh the food. Oh my gosh, it's like 10 pounds. Right, this is, this is why I'm illustrating the story. <laughs> this is why I'm illustrating the story. So that doesn't count the food I was eating, that was just from the protein supplement, 200 grams a day of that protein supplement, plus the food I was eating. I was working out, I hit this plateau, I couldn't advance my strength or shape my body more, I was, I was just hitting this wall. And I thought, okay, if I had increased the protein, surely something's gonna break loose. So consistently, I was taking this in. I was still hitting the wall. Then, this is where we come to the sheet because we're gonna talk about the quality of the protein. <clears throat> I thought I had some clean protein I was using. Then I switched and used a different type, a different type, we're gonna talk about type in a minute. The grams of protein went from the supplement, went from 200 a day down to 36. So I got really, really skeptical. I thought, you know, I'm taking a 200 and I'm still not breaking through this. What would make, us, would make me think that dropping it down to 36 would actually help? Still kept eating the same food. Changing the type of protein, dropping it down to 36, but changing the type, within one week, I actually broke through the wall. So the type of the protein matters. So this first highlight here on this paper, the ideal amount of protein you should consume each day is a bit uncertain. So this is a question I get a lot. How much protein do I need to take in per day? The thing is, every one of us has a different body. Every one of us has a different met metabolism. So with every one of us, those numbers are gonna be different. I see coaches all the time teaching, you know, let's count macros, this, these are your macros, this is what you need to stay with. Some people get results from that because it happens to mesh up with where their body's at. Other people don't get results and I see them frustrated. And this is why, because everybody is different. The ideal amount of protein you should consume each day is a bit uncertain. There is no way that they even, this, this is from Harvard, okay? This is why I pointed this out. This is from Harvard. There is no way that even a prestigious medical school, Harvard Medical School, can figure out exactly what each one of us needs as far as the protein intake. If they can't figure it out, what makes us think a nutritionist can figure it out? Okay, so wanted to highlight that. Over to the next page, the second highlight to pay more attention to the type of protein in your diet rather than the amount. So that's where we go back to my story. I was taking in a high amount, but the, the type, the quality wasn't where it needed to be. 
I lowered the amount, but I raised the quality and it changed my body. So when it goes into your body, that's when it counts. That's when it matters because what happens inside, that's when the changes occur. So I printed this out because I want y'all to be able to read over what it's saying. The next thing, can too much protein be harmful? And it lists different things that the medical community has to list saying it could be harmful. But then the next highlight, however, keep in mind these are only associations. So if you happen to look at studies, scientific studies, or look at popular media, media articles, they're always gonna come at their own angle. They're gonna have one idea they're gonna push, and they're gonna say, hey, this is what you need to believe, this is where you need to go with this, whatever their idea is. So coming from Harvard Medical School, keep in mind these are only associations. There are some studies that have noticed conditions among people on high protein diets, that doesn't mean the protein actually caused the condition because they're not taking into account what else is going on in the lifestyle within those studies. Oh, they're taking the high protein. So you see it, you see an article in mass media, high protein diets cause whatever. Well, it gets people's attention, but it's not necessarily true because they pinpoint the high protein when it could be something completely different within those people's lifestyle that caused that issue. They just happen to also have high protein in common. All right, so you can read over that later. I really wanna to come to this second handout, bring attention to this, cooking and processing methods. The first highlight here it says HCAs, it gets really technical. That's why I printed this portion of it out so you can actually read that later if you want. Basically carcinogens, things that are, are known to cause cancer. These specific carcinogens are made when creatines and amino acids react together with heat. So in all my nutrition studies, one thing that, one of the basic scientific principles we have to learn, there are different things that destroy protein, that agitate protein, that, that mess protein up, the protein molecule, the structure. And if that structure is messed up, then when we take it into our body, the body can't use it. It's a piece, it's a glob of protein is what it becomes, and the body can't use it. Heat is one of those things that agitates the protein, it changes it. So when we heat the protein up too hot for too long, the protein molecule changes shape and it basically glues itself together. And when you have that glue that you're taking in your body, the body can't break it down and use it. The body has to be able to break down the protein into the amino acids to use it. When we heat it for too long, we destroy that ability. So how much do we take in each day that we've, we've heated too long, too hot for too long, that the body's not, not even using what we're taking in. Now, one thing I want to distinguish on this paper, they're trying to highlight meat and, and decipher whether the meat is causing illnesses like cancer. And going through this paper, they actually come to the end of it and say, we cannot actually say that meat specifically itself causes cancer. As we go through these highlights, I want to bring your attention to the fact that people cook veggies. We don't always eat them raw. Sometimes we do, we don't always. People cook veggies. There, are pro there is protein, there are amino acids in veggies. If heat kills the protein, destroys the protein in meat, because it's heat, it's gonna do the same thing in veggies. So if we heat the veggies too hot for too long, the amino acids in the veggies, the protein in the veggies, are also gonna get destroyed. So it goes the same way. All right, so dropping down to industry practices, pesticides used and or medications or hormones. This is another thing that messes with the protein that's in the meat. Mm -hmm. So this is why when we go to the store and we buy something off the shelf and we don't know where it was grown, where the source is, it can actually not work the way we want it to in our body. 
that stuff comes through, some of it stays attached to the meat. So in addition to whether pesticides are being used on the feed, what the animal is eating is equally important. Now I've highlighted the inflammation producing properties because on the uh, grain based diets, we've touched on that before in another, in another talk. Okay. So what the animal's fed make, is, makes a difference. Fed grain is not a natural diet. It's, uh, people suffer from inflammation today. You're, you're good. People suffer from inflammation, and we try to figure out where it's coming from. This is part of the cause of that, because it's not, it's not specifically the animal, just because we eat animal that causes inflammation, because people eat animals and they don't get inflammation, they don't get inflamed. But when we look at what's been done to that animal, then we say, Huh, but most studies don't make that link. Okay, so research suggests that pastured cows, I find this really interesting. Pastured cows, so they're not the farmed, factory farmed cows, produce up to 500% more of the CLA over grain fed cows. And grain fed would be the factory farmed cows. So when you do it naturally, and this is a good fat, CLA is a good fat. So when you do it naturally, the cows that are raised naturally, the meat that we eat from it comes out surprisingly much healthier. Who would have thought? <laughs> so the type of protein that we take in makes a huge difference. All right, so what is the evidence? The limitations of the research in this area they are actually honest and they let us know that when they've looked at these studies pertaining to this subject, the research that they've looked at is, has limitations because the studies have not been done properly or broad enough and so there's limitations. So almost all the studies were either preclinical animal model studies, which means those results may not translate to human populations. So. They're studying things like rats, or they're studying something in the lab that may or may not translate to what happens within our body. But then they come out with a media article that says, look at what this will do to your body. But they didn't study it in our body. So I think it was last time when I talked about, maybe two sessions ago, when I talked about how we become their guinea pigs, and they study us later on. Well, no, last time. Last time? This, this helps to admit that. So most of the rest of the studies were what they call epidemiological. It's kind of just a broad view of it, which is not possible to be conclusive regarding cause and effect. It goes back to, well, everybody that eats a high protein diet seems to come out with this. So we will automatically link it to the high protein diet, even though there's all the other factors that these people share that they're ignoring. Okay. All right. Ne next here, there were mixed results. Okay, I highlighted that because that goes back to the cancer issue. There were mixed results because above it it says there's a positive association. You eat meat, you're going to get this cancer. But then on the other hand, there's mixed results. Some people didn't get this cancer from eating this, so we don't know why. There was no statistically significant association observed for the intakes of other red or processed meats. That struck me because of the word processed in there. They are actually admitting that they have watched some people that eat processed meats, which honestly I'm going to advise you against anyway, <clears throat> but they have studied people eating processed meats that have not gotten sick. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the byproducts of processing have shown associations with several cancers, but poultry Poultry, on the other hand, may lead to a decreased risk of sickness. So, it's a different type of protein. We go back to that, it's a different type of protein, different quality. Fish, another different type, seems protective against cancer. So the overarching claim on the next page to avoid all meat and animal products is not warranted. 
depending on the type of animal protein and the way it's prepared. And at the end of that, it says, buy the best quality you can find, grass-fed pasture-raised are best. So that's what I wanna highlight is, it always comes down to the type. What is mostly on the market today, when we go to the grocery store, we go to, even to a supplement store, what is mostly on the shelf is very low quality, very low. Even when, even when the people in the retail store, the supplement store say, well, buy this stuff because it's popular selling or it's, it's, it's our best brand. I don't give a crap what's popular or what they consider the best brand. What's on the ingredient label? We went over that last time. What's on the ingredient label? Because whatever's on there tells me what is actually in that. It's the type of protein, the quality of protein. When we take that in, that is what makes a difference in the cells how well the cells digest it. If it's glued itself together, the cells can't digest it. It gets stuck, it either gets lodged or locked up in our fat cells, which adds to the fat on our body, or if we're lucky, the body flushes it all out, which means we just ate a bunch of protein and didn't do nothing with it, it just went right through us. Either way, not exactly the desirable result. So the, the type of the protein, we need to make sure that it's not glued itself together. It's all natural, intact, the way it needs to be, so when we take it in, the body can break it apart. Because that's what it needs to do. It needs to break each protein molecule apart into the amino acids, send it where it needs to send it, then our body says, oh, that's what I need. But then when we take in all the stuff that's way down here on the quality rank, we take it in, we're wasting our money. We really are. Wasting our money, wasting our time, and wasting the food that we're eating because the food ain't doing nothing for us other than letting us stay hungry and adding mass to our body. <laughs> adding unwanted mass and we're still hungry. <laughs> all right, so it comes down to the, the type and the quality. All right, I hope you got that out of this. Any questions about the, the handouts or anything? No, no? I'm, I'm sound like this week was going for my protein about day three, I was like, I don't know about, you know, so, <laughs> I'm, you know, I've, I've got to come up with, okay. and, and these are all good things, and I know two women who have cancer, that their doctor, they have to eat protein at each time they eat, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it's a, they have a list to go by, so that, you know, every, what was said in here, and then they were also told, gotta stay away from the sugar, because sugar, sugar and cancer. I was gonna say, that's, if it's a list that came from the doctors, even that, the doctors are, are doing the best with the knowledge they have available to them, but even those lists have really severe limitations. Hopefully your friends will start getting better from it, but there's One a limit. Really, just, she's just had a lot of mm -hmm. bad things, you know. And I remember one of the women, her doctor, she was eating so much, and then that's where you get with the grams. They were thinking, well, when you weigh the meat, mm -hmm. and the meat weighs X number of grams, that's how much gram protein. No, yeah. that's what it weighs. That's right, what the right. Meat weighs. It's just what it weighs. You've yeah. got to figure out. <laughs> yeah. So then they're all like, I guess the doctor didn't, but some of them, they were doing some of those liquid protein supplements. And I mm. wondered about that. Yeah. But because they usually have sweet and, you know. And if it came from a doctor, stuff. recommendation from the doctor is probably something along the lines of Slim Fast or. Um, One of those muscle milk, I think. Okay, muscle milk, muscle that's milk. from Walmart. Um, There's stuff like that along like that line. Ensure. And that's what I was trying to think okay. of. Nice and fast. Ensure. Ensure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's the man. <laughs> um, so when we go back to the type of the for. protein, the <laughs> type and the quality, that, if they're drinking something like that, Ensure, the muscle milk, when you look at the handout, the type and the quality of the protein, you're not going to find that in those drinks. Okay. Well, yeah. I just, you know, I, I listen to things, things I hadn't. So the sugar thing was a big eye-opener for me because I thought, well, that, that does make sense, you know. Sort of. It's, the sugar is not what actually causes it. 
it's not what turns the switch on. But now once the switch is turned on, the feeds. sugar will multiply it. Okay. Yeah. It feeds it. And I think that that's cancer yeah. feeds on sugar. Yeah. Do what? Cancer feeds on sugar. It feeds on it. It multiplies it, but it has to be turned on first. It's usually the casein in the protein that turns it on. Once it's turned on, then the sugar feeds it. So they cut the sugar back thinking they're gonna kill the cancer because it stops feeding it, when really all we gotta do is tweak the casein balance. We tweak that to turn the cancer off, the sugar's not got anything to feed because the cancer's been turned off. There have been studies showing that, that link, but those studies have been buried because they don't want the mass public to know. Mm -hmm. I've seen the studies through all my coursework, but they've been buried. <laughs> all right. Okay, it's not fair, it's not right, yeah. but it's, it's what they do. <laughs> yeah. All right, so anything else? Or we'll cut this one short tonight because I think the handouts covered it pretty good. Yeah.